My name is Ken Snyder. My name is Claudia Snyder. My name is Jacob. My daughter Katie. My daughter Katie. My wife Katie, and the mother of my six children, was killed by a drunk driver. I like to always refer to Katie as she was growing up as being smart and sassy. She was brilliant, straight A student, but she had a little bit of sass to her, and she wasn't afraid to give that back to her to her parents or to her friends, or to her siblings, or anybody else. Actually, I met Katie's dad first, and he asked uh, you know, if I was dating anyone, and I said no, I was completely single, and he started giving me a really hard time about it. Finally, I asked him, are you offering? And he said, well, what are you looking for? I said, smart and sassy. He said, hmm, I got one of those. So long story short, she picked me up at the airport on December 20th, and we got engaged on December 30th. Her dominating characteristic was really her compassion. She was just the nicest person you ever met. Katie, ever since we'd gotten married, uh, she had wanted a little girl. We ended up with four boys. We were really lucky that, you know, our fifth kid was a girl. And so was the sixth. We had twins, which we're really excited about, but then we found out that they were super duper high risk. What are called mono-mono twins, one amniotic sac, one placenta. And so what happens is that the umbilical cords eventually get tangled around each other and start to cut off the oxygen and the nutrition and things on October 6, 2017. She was frustrated because Hannah wasn't doing very well and she really wanted to hold Hannah, but the NICU nurse wouldn't let her. She was tired. So I told her, you know, just let it go right now. Come home, get a good night's sleep and let's talk about it in the morning. Uh, she said, all right, I'll come home. And you know that was the last time I spoke to her ever. So that was around 11 o'clock. Uh, around midnight when she wasn't home, I started to get a little bit nervous. Uh, so I tried to give her a call and I went straight to voicemail. I tried calling again and again. By 1.30 when I couldn't get an answer, I have a friend who's a police officer. So I called him at 1.30 in the morning. He was kind enough not to complain. He just asked what the situation was and I told him that, that she was driving a, a Prius, her mom's Prius, and that I couldn't get a hold of her. So he said he would look into it. And then when he, finally at 2.30, when I kept hounding him, he tried to ease my mind. He said, look, you're probably fine because no Priuses have been in any accidents tonight. The only fatality was a Honda Civic hybrid. <sighs> I realized that her mom's car was actually a, a Honda Civic hybrid just a mile from my house. The road was blocked off, it was taped off, and I could see there was an accident off in the distance. I try and duck under the tape, but the policeman stops me and says, hey, you can't go back there. I said, look, that's my wife, I think. I need to go back there, I need to see that for myself. And they said, no, you can't. They couldn't identify her body for hours and hours because the body was so severely damaged, they couldn't even match her to her, her photo or anything um, and finally they, they identified her through dental records and birthmarks um, because her face was so mutilated from the from the accident my whole world went dark the love of my life was gone you know I I went home and I cried knelt down and prayed and I didn't I didn't know what else to do and I just kept thinking what am I gonna tell these kids uh, I decided I didn't want to interrupt their last good night's sleep thinking their mom was still alive. You know, once they were all awake, then I had to sit them down and tell them that their mom was not gonna be coming home again. Um, Gideon, the youngest boy, this one here, um, for the first two and a half weeks or so, didn't stop crying once. He would cry all day long. He would cry himself to sleep at night. He wouldn't go to bed. He wouldn't go to bed till February. The accident was the first part of October. Um, because I think he didn't know who was going to die if he went to bed. I became the mom for about three months and went down, tried to follow Katie's example. I did at one time, one of the boys looked at me because um, they were getting mad because I was now the enforcer of the rules and etc. And um, said, but we don't want you to be our mom. And I thought, you know what, I don't want to be your mom, I'd rather be your grandma, but that's what it, what it had to be. 
the the offender was a young woman, 21 years old. Um, our understanding is she was three weeks past her 21st birthday at the time of the accident. Over three times the legal limit uh, alcohol in her blood. Katie was the kind of person who would forgive somebody who is struggling in life. We don't we don't wish ill on her at all. I I just wish she wouldn't have killed my daughter. I don't know that I'll ever be healed all the way. I just like I said, there's a hole in my heart, and I don't I don't think that. Well, I hope it never does because I think that if if to me if it heals and closes up, then it's like she was never there. I run an executive education program that's part of the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. We work very closely with the, the automotive electronic suppliers. They're people that I interact with pretty regularly. Uh, they're people that are my friends. They're people that know the tragedy of our family. And once we got the family stabilized, I kept wondering in the back of my head, these guys have showed me all this cool AV stuff and you know, self-driving cars and everything else. I've got to, I kept thinking, there's got to be a technology out there to, to, to do. These guys can do anything with the technology with cars. They've got to be able to stop drunk and impaired driving too. And so I called them up. I started calling them up. And the, ver the very first conversation I had was with one of my good friends who's a senior executive at one of the tier one auto electronic suppliers. And, and he said, yeah, the technology's been around for years. Some of it's on cars and we just don't turn it on. Some of it's been sitting production ready, but we haven't put it on cars yet. And then he you know, went through the conversation with him about why isn't it on cars? Well, it's not mandated. And why don't you turn it on? Well, because if they turn it on, turn the technology on, they want to be able to charge money for it and so on. I got down on my knees and, and asked for guidance. And the answer was, go to MAD. It, it's, it blows my mind. The technology to completely eliminate drunk driving exists. Think about it. Over 10,000 people a year die from drunk driving. And for each person that dies from drunk driving, how many people suffer? In my case, there were literally thousands of people who were impacted by Katie's death. Despite everyone's best intention, you cannot bring someone back. The best way to address it is to keep it from happening in the first place. The technology exists. So I applaud Ken for you know, trying to get the right people together so that we can hopefully solve this once and for all. There's no reason that alcohol should have killed my wife. So I think we should have enough guts as a society to say no more. No more drunk driving, no more innocent victims. Matt has now though become the vehicle for me to find more meaning in Katie's death. Um, if, if we can stop 10,000 people a year from dying from the way Katie died, then that will be something that I can say, you know, when I see Katie again, I can say, all right, I didn't just let your, the grief from your death overtake us. I fought, I fought, I fought hard, and now we're saving lives. Thank you.